This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 126. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And if you can hear the pitter-patter of raindrops above me, it is spring. And <laughs> we're recording at the shop, and uh, right as we started recording, it started raining, which I think means snow up in the high country, but... We thought we'd bring you some nice spring ambiance. All right, real quick. A uh, couple things in the newsroom and notes section is uh, I have been informed by the powers that be at Free Heal Life. We are going to be releasing our first batch of Free Heal Life protector skis here pretty soon, probably within a week. And you'll be able to get those online. So we're going to batch these out and release them sort of in sections of time so that you can get at those. So be sure to stay tuned to freehealllife.com. Like I always mention, get on the mailing list because we'll obviously tell people there first and then social media. So be sure to check that out. Uh, You may have also received an email if you're on our email list about a Telemark community survey that we're doing. And... If you have not received that, you're not on the mailing list because you never listen to the podcast and I tell you to get on the mailing list every week, uh, you can find that in the show notes and get on the mailing list. So we're doing this community survey to get some more information about you as a Telemark skier, where you live, what you like to do, what kind of equipment you're using, and so on. Uh, We're going to be offering a coupon to those who... Uh, participate in this as a thank you gift and one lucky person will be drawn at the end of the two weeks and will have a pair of free your life protector skis so plenty of incentives to help per- participate in this community survey and get us some more information so be sure to check that out uh, in your email inbox or on the links on social media or anywhere else that we're putting out information. There's still a couple of demo skis and boots available left for sale. Uh, so you can check those out over at freehealllife.com. And there's obviously a few things left from the past season. So, uh, most of it, thank you for supporting the shop and getting that out the door. Uh, we're just going to keep that up there until it's gone. So, uh, as far as new merchandise, uh, we've got the Guru Lu T uh, back in stock. You can find that on the website. And for those of you who picked up that batch of Telemark Skier mesh back hats, they are all gone, but we'll be redoing those in the future. So lots of fun stuff coming out this summer in terms of lifestyle stuff. So you can keep repping Free Heal Life and obviously tell everybody that you're a telemark skier since that's always the joke you obviously need stuff to wear in order to proclaim your awesomeness when you walk into a room and you can do that by wearing free heel life or telemark skier gear throughout the summer so that's all i've got in the newsroom and notes i am excited to have my guest today he's one of our great free heel life employees he's just completed his third year here at the shop and uh, is one of our lead salespeople and our go-to guys for used Telemark gear. And we've recently promoted him to our Free Heal Life Manufacturing Manager. And he will be heading up our product production over the summer, which will include our protector line of skis. So please welcome Nate Nordell. How's it going, Josh? Good to have you here, man. How you doing? Another day in paradise. Always another day in paradise. Yeah, life's what you make it, so let's make it paradise. Well, it's going to be nice and uh, nice and uh, deep in paradise as we have a uh, nice, cheap mimosa in front of us this afternoon. Um, I was supposed to bring this mimo- Well, we were supposed to do a podcast before the smelly knee pad, and uh, that did not work out. I got kind of sick, as I mentioned on the podcast last week. Uh, but I did have a bottle of cheap, uh, I mean, extremely expensive champagne yeah. and freshly squeezed orange juice. 
uh, for us to partake in. So yeah, nothing like a midday man. Excuse me, a midday mimosa. Midday mimosa. <laughs> Why can't we say that word? Midday <laughs> mimosa. Midday mimosa. So that's a good one. Like red leather, yellow leather. I can't do those. Oh. Anyways, welcome back to the podcast. Always great to be here. This is number three. I'm I'm proud of you for making the third one. You've never been by yourself because we didn't know if you should be on by yourself or not. You know, <laughs> I, I can get myself into trouble when I'm by myself. <laughs> uh, so we've kind of covered, I, I wanted to have you on. Obviously, congratulations on being our, our new production manager and uh, building skis. And I definitely want to get into that because we talked about letting go of a batch of skis here coming up and you've been hard at work. So congratulations to you, my friend. Well, thank you. It's been a dream come true. I'm glad. <laughs> it's, it, it's definitely more work than I, I had imagined in, in fairy tale land of what building skis is like, but I know I, I want to get, I want to get into this deeper because I, I think I, that was definitely one of the questions I thought is talking about skis and, um, maybe people's perceptions of what, it, what a ski is and how it is made. So, um, but first I want to go for those of you who have listened to, to Nate on our past podcast, one of the most common things that comes up is obviously your quiver, um, quiver. I guess I should describe what a quiver is. If people are not familiar, if you're like a beginner skier, I don't know why you wouldn't know this, but it's like a quiver of arrows, right? But Nate has a quiver of skis. Most of us, when we think quiver, we think like, you know, like two pair, three pairs of skis, or maybe you've got that quiver killer sort of, I've got one ski that does it all. Nate is a connoisseur of fine collecting and has a number of skis, boots, and bindings. Uh, why don't you update the people on uh, where you're at? Okay. Uh, let's let's start with boots. Um <laughs> So boots, I have three pairs of F1s, uh, one of each model. So F1, F1 race, F1 race carbon. And uh, those will, one is duck butted that I use as my backcountry boot. I uh, have about just shy of 60 days on that right now. So it's holding up really well. It is it, The Michael Bolton's holding up? Yeah, it's holding on. Um, and it works great. Works in both my Lynx and my Majos. So it, uh, it's got me into the back country and it hasn't blown up yet. Which one, wait, which one's the back country one you use? So I'm using the standard, uh, F1, F1 race. So I don't have a tongue on mine currently. Uh, I will be modding, uh, Do my, you, ca- you don't carry the tongue up with you. Mm-mm. So the, the only the F1 has the tongue adapter where you can even put a tongue on it. How do you ski with no tongue? Uh, the cuff has a wrap around and oh, you know, gotcha. it's, it's, you think I'd be great. like more well versed in this, but I don't actually, actually, no, I do have F ones now. You do. I have not skied. <laughs> I, I got not, you a pair. <laughs> you got me a pair. I have not skied them. Um, okay. So it's, uh, that makes sense. So it's a wrap around cuff. It's not yeah. like an open cuff with mm-hmm. no tongue. Yeah. Got it. So, uh, those, uh, will be fully modded and I'll have three by next winter. Um, so that's, uh, my prime touring boot. Uh, secondary is going to be a pair of Mastralade cuffed TX pros. And those are something I'll get a little bit sendier with. Um, but describe uh, sendier, uh, just like, like I, I don't like, just like I'll it, jump off rocks. I'll actually want to ski bigger <laughs> lines on that. Um, rather than, Hey, I'm going for a walk and you know, taking videos of T2 or, you know, just going for a tour to get some mellow pow turns in. Getting sendier. Just, yeah. I just want to make sure we covered the glossary of what, what the, uh, the young folks are saying, just in case you want to get sendy out there. Yeah. Okay. So you can get sendy on your F1s is the, the point. Not, not so much. It's not comfortable. What's well, not comfortable. It's like, way softer than the the tx and then the you don't uh, the upper have part of the the boot right? bellow as well oh interesting um the the bellow's nice i would say it's a little bit more consistent than mm. the tx um but it's it's a solid setup but the cuff you just don't have that forward pressure um where the standard f1 you do have that tongue but i'm gonna do 
but it doesn't have as good of a walk mode with uh, the original hmm. F1s where the F1 carbon has a really good walk mode and then a carbon upper. And so it's a bit lighter as well. Real quick before we move on from, I mean, you just describe like three boots, like most people have one boot and we haven't even moved on to normal boots. Yeah. Um, the F1, if you're not familiar with it, if you're a gear nerd, you get this, but like the F1 is technically a, well, I guess not, it's not currently made, but it's the F1, this version had a bellow and it's an Alpine touring boot. And then you can use it for TTS or modify it with this 3D printed thing called the Michael Bolton. Yes, that's a reference to the singer and uh, allows you to use Majo and Lynx that has a second heel connection. But I want to ask you, Nate, so of all, I mean, that essentially what what i think people the 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 small community that thinks about small lightweight boots in the backcountry essentially this is what you've created with the f1 so how necessary is it to have that kind of a boot completely unnecessary but when you spend 30 plus days in the backcountry a year if you can go lighter you probably want to. I guess, he, yeah, and I, I can understand that. I'm, I'm softening up to the idea of weight or less, less weight. And I used to just not really think it was that big a deal. I, 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 I get the, I get the, the sentiment now. How much, because you're, you're good with weights. The lightest pair that you're using the most of your F1s is how much less than your TX or TX Pros. So then a standard pair of TX Pros, I think it's about 500 grams oh, lighter. Oh, wow. So it's pretty significant. Yeah. Like it's it's noticeably lighter. Yeah. Um, and then when I do ski inbounds, I'm either on TXs uh, when I want to really low smoke it. Um, but when I want to charge a bit harder, I do ski Pros, but then I have those power blocked and booster strapped. Um, nothing stock, nothing stock. And then I usually go with a wrap liner on my resort boots, uh, huh. just because it's a little bit stiffer and Telly Tay swapped over to the wrap liner this year and very much liked it. So everybody's got the wrap. Yeah. Huh? That's interesting. Okay. I didn't mean to go too sideways on that. Um, so that's, that's your tour. That, those are just your touring boots. Those so you are just my touring boots. Three F three pairs of F ones. Yep. One of each. And then I have Mistrali cuff TX pros that, uh, turn that TX pro into a three buckle, better range of motion, and then lost about the weight of a buckle and a little bit of cuff plastic from shaving. And then I have two pairs of TXs, one new in box that I'm saving till the Wow. The ones I'm skiing blow up. Same green and gray or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I really want another pair of orange ones, but uh, haven't found a pair of my size for a those reasonable price. Those are stiffer. Price. That's what I've heard, is they're just a little bit stiffer. I don't think I ever owned a pair of those, but they are they are stiffer than, than the ones you're talking about, the green and gray. Yeah. And I, I haven't noticed like my original pair of tx pros the bellow is quite soft at this point that has the mastrale cuff on it where it, at this point it's basically a tx with a stiffer cuff hmm. with a little bit more range of motion um but then i have tx pros that are power blocked booster strapped wrap linered and then same thing with my comps um the comps this year i've skied one day on them Oh, so you're going back to softer boots. I I basically all on TX. Uh, Why do you think that is? This is an interesting thing that ke- seems to come up often is this metamorphosis from stiff boots to not so stiff boots. Um, so on that tangent, uh, that's that was kind of a rabbit hole for me uh, this year um, in becoming a Majo full-time skier, essentially. Oh yeah, you're all about the M equipment major. I am at this point. It it's a wonderful, smooth binding. Um, but for me, uh, my introduction into Telly was on Targas and then to uh, free rides. And the free ride is 
if you know, a very toey binding. And so coming from the Targa and then going to a very toey binding, uh, I, I feel like that's what I like learned tip, on. Tip toey. Tip toey. Yep. Um, and that's what I learned on. And I feel like I got very accustomed to that and then skied two and a half seasons all on outlaws and a little bit on links and demoed the Majo a little bit, but never with red line springs. Um, and it wasn't until the end of last year where I picked up a pair of bishops and was like, Oh, this is like similar to the outlaw, but it does feel different. And I guess my big problem with the bishops is it has a hard stop if you want to get really low and I feel that in the front of my knees. Mm. And so, uh, I definitely like the bishops for going fast with that rear, with that spring underfoot that was kind of designed to have a little bit of preload and hold the binding to the ski when you're walking around with them. Um, but, uh, if I want to go really fast, I do like the bishops a little bit more, um, than the outlaws. Um, just because it, is just a little bit more secure of an alpine turn uh, if you have to go to that oh crap mode. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I just felt like I couldn't get the sensation that I wanted out of the outlaw where for the correct amount of preload that I wanted, I would have to crank the stiffy springs tighter than what I wanted. And so in that ramp up of the outlaw spring progression, the lower you go, the more it wants to stand you back up. I just don't weigh enough at 140 pounds to rock the outlaws as stiff as I wanted for the preload that I wanted. Hmm. Um, and so this year got a pair of majos and put red line springs in those with brakes. And I was like, yep, this does everything I want it to do. I don't have to swap between outlaw and links or Bishop outlaw and links with my Nate cert insert pattern. And <laughs> Which, if you don't know, is an 11 hole uh, insert pattern. Uh, so you can do bishop and 22 and have the heel blocks. You're basically a snowboarder at that point. Yeah. At that point, I just am swapping bindings every other morning or in the parking lot. And I kind of got sick of doing that for the last two years. So, wait. So, you. So, the reason you like stiff springs is for the preload? Yeah. Not actually for the, like, when you drop your knee sensation? Not like I, I do like a good amount of preload on there with the majos and the red lines. I run at a three and a half uh, where I set that silver washer on the back mm -hmm. up between the three and the four line. Um, and that has the right amount of preload where if I'm going through whoops or chunder or crud, um, I don't feel like I'm getting thrown over the handlebars oh. if I'm not in a telly stance. That's what I was wondering. That's crazy. I would have never even thought about spring from a preload, keep your foot down thing. I only think about, when I think about spring tension, I think about the tension forward, not what's holding me down. But like you said, on the Bishop, you like it because it, it's almost got that like snap down like it, it yeah there there's resistance before you even start moving yeah where on the outlaw i feel like there's just a a mill or two a play mm -hmm. of wiggle right off the deck and then it has a ramp up in that spring progression where i feel like the majos are very linear mm -hmm. and with the bishops you can get a pretty linear uh spring progression where right now i run one soft spring and one standard spring to get a medium spring um, spring configuration on the bishops and then oh, I run God. those at like a two. Oh, you run two different springs. Yeah. One soft, one medium, man. You got all sorts of weird shit going on. <laughs> yeah. And I run that both on my 75 BMFRs and my NTN. Uh, what are you skiing 75 on the BMFs? T races. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so oh, yeah, that, sorry. I, we, I, we went I off on the tangent. I of, forgot we weren't done with boots. <laughs> Jeez, um, but yeah. So with with that binding, I the the major gives me that correct amount of preload where I can I don't feel like I have to alpine it in the oh crap mode, um, as well as I don't feel like the skis get chucked out from under me forward. Um, where if I get a little back seat, I don't feel like that drop knee wants to rock it forward. Where with if you crank those outlaws and you don't weigh a lot, it does that a lot. And it was going through footage this summer of uh me 
crashing and like, oh, why does that keep happening? And then tried softening the binding and I was just like, I don't like how the outlaw feels at softer settings. Mm. And so tried other bindings, tried the bishop. I didn't, I did feel a hard stop on the bishop um, when I do ski lower. And this year I definitely ski much lower than I have in years past with the majos. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, you got my brain all over. I'm like, uh, okay, real quick recap. So we're up to like three, three pairs of three F1s, pairs of F ones, two, get- two pairs of TX, TX one in use, one not in use. Yep. And then I have a pair of Mastralid cuff TX pros. Okay. Then I have a pair of TX pros, booster strap, power blocked, wrap linered. Yep. Same with my comps. One and, pair, one pair of comps. Yep. One pair of women's pros, uh, because it's a better color lo- wave than the men's <laughs> and, uh, it's the same boot. Yep. How many pair of 75 mil? Uh, so is that all the NTN boots? That's all the NTN boots. Okay. Then you got T race. Then I have, uh, let's start with leathers. Okay. Uh, then I have a pair of, um, Fabiano double leathers, uh, as my nice. low cuff, uh, leather boot. And then I have a pair of Arcos uh, Super Comps, which is a leather boot with a plastic cuff. Yep. Um, and some straps uh, that really I max out. And then I got a Vole strap them to get them real tight. Um, I didn't even know you had all this. Yeah. This is hilarious. <laughs> and then into real 75 millimeter boots, I have uh, two pairs of T Race candy canes. Um, one is. Uh, pink and not very nice and minty um and then the second pair is very uh fresh and ready to go and then i have a pair of red candy canes or not candy canes red tea races um just because you want both color waves (laughs) um and then i have a pair of bd customs in the purple color wave waiting to get my hands on a pair of gold because you don't have Oh, obviously. I know, but you know, I figured I found a pair in my size and I I needed to grab on them or jump on them, and so I got the purple pair and uh figured I should uh just wait until a gold pair jumps up and then I'll add those to the quiver. That's going to be hard to find the the gold ones. So wait, BD boots you only have the purple customs. Customs. Yeah. No then, pu- no popsicle pushes. Uh the creamsicle pushes yeah. I I want, but they're just so prone to blowing up and if I'm going to ski 75 mm, I'm going to ski the stiffest boot possible. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow, that's a, it's, okay, so what's just so we we're already 20 minutes in and we just talked about boots. <laughs> Can you believe that? All right. No. So okay, so how many what's the total boot number? So three F ones, three T races, two pros. Uh, that's six, right? Or eight? I, I thought you were counting. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> two leathers, three T races, a pair of customs, and then we have three pairs of F ones, and then a pair of Mistralade pros, two pairs of T Xs. And then pros and comps. So we're up to 14. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, okay. So I don't want to get too deep in the skis, like specifics, mm-hmm. but what, how, what is the number of skis that you have that could be skied right now? 11. Oh, that's not that bad. Oh, that's like with bindings. That's, on them. that's with bindings on them or inserts like ready to go with the nate nate cert yeah with the nate cert or tm trademark yeah. that <laughs> nate cert um okay how many pairs total of skis total pairs of skis um we are in my bedroom i had to count and it's 54 that i'm not skiing <laughs> um that's including the 11 no okay So that's 54 that are just ready to be turned into ski benches or, you know, turned into smelly comp setups when people need long skis. I got some of those hiding around. And then I got a few hiding around here at the shop. And then I think 
it's like six pairs here at the shop and then another 12 at my parents house wow that's so, insane yeah do you think you'll ever ski all of them again or do you just kind of like keep them? No, at this point, most of the ones that have been retired, I'm just keeping them and they'll eventually get cut up and turned into ski benches. I think this summer I want to do a bed frame for myself because I'm a bachelor and why not? A bed frame out of skis? Yeah. Interesting. All right. That's cool. Etsy's taught me a lot about <laughs> what you can turn skis into. You can do fancy wine bottle holders. You can do these fancy little snowflakes some kitschy what? kitschy stuff for ladies in park city that really want the do you have your own etsy shop i will that's awesome eventually i wonder if you could actually like do like bed springs with skis you'd probably have to have a lot of the same flex of ski bed springs yeah because if you the, think the like, slats yeah like underneath you know okay like you know like if you buy like a I don't know. Some of the more modern beds just have like sort of a, like an Ikea bed or something like yeah. that where it's got like the little ribs, but mm -hmm. they kind of flex downward. I wonder if you could actually take skis and sort of. Oh, a full ski bed. I was just going to set it up where I could just roll out one of those Ikea slats and then just have that in. So are you just talking like decorative ski bed? No, like I was going to do the, the, the full like frame out of like a, the sides out of two by six, but then covered in skis oh and then like got it got the it the okay. headboard and footboard or baseboard uh, the bottom part of the bed were gonna be skis gotcha so it's like it's like uh like uh almost like a throne at the beginning yeah the, at the top that's just mm -hmm. like skis yeah shooting up everywhere yep <laughs> and then do like a couple of chairs and like an ottoman <laughs> like all all of the furniture in my new place is just gonna be ski wow ski furniture that's epic and then i i will have a ski room uh where i'll have a closet to hang all my apparel so it's not all in your bedroom yeah wow i'm impressed i'm impressed i don't even know how you collect all this it's amazing it's, uh, it's years in the making what do you well so one thing i always think is interesting talking to you is like i i think it's good because you've had the experience of skiing a lot of different types of skis and then modifying stuff um which i think gives you a better feel for you know, just skis in general or boots or bindings, <clears throat> um, which is kind of that that's, what's interesting about you going down the Majo rabbit hole this year for me is, um, what do you think? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, just the, the feel of it, you know, I mean, is that pretty much all that the feel, the releasability, the fact that it's the most releasable binding. Have you come out yet? Yeah. Yeah, a bunch. Not not a bunch. Uh, more than the Outlaws, for sure. Mm -hmm. Where I would say, unless I'm tomahawking down the mountain, yeah, I'm not coming not out of the Outlaws. Yeah. Where, like, I'll watch T2 and Telly Tay and Wyatt and some of the other guys that ski hard up at Alta. And, like, they'll come out of them more than I would say I do. But I would say a lot of that has to do with weight. Where yeah, I, I weigh 40 to a hundred pounds less than most of those guys. And so, but you rock stiffs, like you said, and that's always been the dilemma is with a free ride, a uh, Rotofella free ride or the 22 designs bindings in order to increase the, uh, releaseability, you have to back off the preload, which is opposite of how you want to ride. And yeah. I think that's what M equipment did pretty well is they managed to separate the two things. So you can ride, high preload but uh so it's stiffer and then back off so you have low like a low point of releasability based on your weight which is pretty interesting i'm i and nobody else has that yeah and so and like my big transition to telly was because i blew out both acls mm -hmm. and on alpine and so releasability and knowing that it will release not only from the heel but also the toe uh, if I really blow up on those um, is reassuring. And in my testing a few years ago between the Lynx and the Majo, I didn't notice a whole lot of releasability difference, but I was trying to come out. Mm. Um, and since then, I feel like both Lynx and Majo tech toes have gotten better. And I felt like I was coming out on the tech toes before I ever got to the heel mm. on the Majo. And now the toes are a bit snappier on both and you I feel like I noticed that heel release hmm. a bit more on the Majo. And for me, 
the fact that I'm not swapping between Outlaw and Lynx on skis all the time, where it's just like, oh, Majo's on there. That's what I'm skiing. And this year, I really tried to push myself off the, the Bent Chetler 120s as my everyday ski to not catch as much grief for drifting around as well as... Did you let the peer pressure get you? I A little bit got to me, but I was also like... I need to ski skinnier skis. Like I, <laughs> I feel like to blame for that too. Cause I used to give you a hard time. Um, hard pack on 120 millimeters underfoot is seems crazy. It's, it's rough. And this year, like it would have been a really bad year to try and like buckle Me. down and like stick to it Yeah, because seven weeks of high pressure and no storms. It was really nice to get out on some skinny, stiff skis and yeah. actually be able to carve turns and, you know, hold an edge first thing in the morning before yeah because you like that kind of drifty yeah very slarvy style as craig S- dosty called it slarvy is such a weird word it, it makes sense it makes sense yeah like where you're you're sliding slide carving slarving i i it's almost not even a card carve i would say it's almost like drifting like i release the back end and kick it sideways without engaging the edge where I do slide sideways a lot longer than most people do. Yeah. Huh? That's crazy, man. Yeah. Well, okay. One, here's a question I wanted to ask you about. So you're, you're literally like the maestro of mods and I'm curious, like, do you see, it seems like there's sort of this emerging market or group of folks like yourself that, are always tinkering, you know? So if, if you had to, if you had, if you had the chance to talk to other companies or, or I don't even know companies, I mean, what, where do you think, where do you think Telemark could benefit from? You know, like obviously we have a lot of parts and stuff like you could like go on our parts wall and pull stuff, but I've always wondered if like, is there an aftermarket type part, you know, like, um, you know, Miles, like with his Subaru, like guys that are into Subarus, like they have like all these aftermarket parts that you can like add to your car. And it's like not from the manufacturer. I mean, just, do you think Telemark has a place for that? Like, are there enough people? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like with the basics of booster straps, power blocks, um, just to stiffen that boot up. Mm-hmm. Um, and those of you that don't know what a power block is, is it's a replacement metal block that replaces your walk mode and so you pull your walk mode off and then bolt a metal block two bolts in the cuff one in the scoffo uh with that pin and then your boot is locked into that yeah it takes fixed that position it takes that little bit of play out that the walk mode has even when it's locked yeah and so that and then liners make a huge difference mm. the the scarpa intuition liners are really great and i ski them until they wear out and usually On my touring boots, I'll just throw new liners in those and then throw wrap liners into my resort boots uh, just to get a little bit more performance on the downhill side of those inbound boots. So are the wrap liners of those intuitions? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I go intuition uh, power wrap um, or just the, the standard wrap. Did you, did you try those zip fits that have come out? I really wanted to try those. Uh, Couldn't, couldn't get my hands on a pair for, for cheap enough. They're expensive, aren't they're, they? They're very expensive. Like oh. retail, I think is like five hundred something bucks. What? Yeah, like ridiculous. Whoa! And like they were that's like as much as the boot. I I know. Jeez, that's crazy. That's retail too. Yeah, five hundred bucks. Wow. I don't even know what's di- what's different about this. So it's it's a cork liner, and so it's heat oh. moldable, and then they like they last a lot longer. Mm. But I haven't spent that much money to demo them out and see if I can put them through a hundred plus day season and be like, Oh yeah, they're still great. Or, Oh, these broke down just like intuitions do after skiing a hundred plus days. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I guess I didn't realize there were that much. I mean, I guess intuitions are in the threes, aren't they? Uh, I think it's like two, two, two to three. If you get the really high end, uh, like plug liners and and that's before fitting and everything. Like you right. can do, I think we charge 30 bucks for the heat mold. Yeah. Or if you buy the boot from us, then we'll mold it for free. But yeah, if you really need boot work done on them, then that's an extra couple hundred bucks. And it's hard to punch telly boots. So if you really got to 
punch the plastic, then you're that's a whole nother thing, whole other investment wow. where you're talking about a car just on boots. That's crazy. Well, maybe, maybe we'll see that. I keep thinking I, for years, I'm like always thinking like aftermarket parts, like, like you said, straps, you know, liners. Um, I mean, all the stuff that you guys are doing with the duck butts, all that kind of stuff is super interesting. So I don't know, I guess it, it, yeah, I guess it just depends on the boots, you know, and I think there's probably more stuff that you could make. I guess it just depends on how many people are, you're, you're an incredibly motivated person when it comes to modifying your stuff. I am not. And I have all the resources of working here. Yeah, that's as true. Well, like you can, yeah, you've got all the tools, you got a bench. Yeah, that's true. And, and I, like, al- I also do, and I don't do any. <laughs> I don't do anything. Yeah, I, I have, I did convert Malik. Malik's my little protege. Uh, Malik, it, for y- you listeners that don't know, he's uh, one of our sales guy that guys that was new this year, um, but converted him to a Majo skier, and then he uh, went through and did the Mistrale swap. Um, and he'll, he'll tell you, uh, it's, it's much easier to measure twice and cut once on the, the boot mods. Uh Um, he, he, he struggled a little bit. He got a little, uh, a little. cut happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we, we had some extra cuffs for him and we, we got him set up and he's now dialed and likes that setup, but he got a pair of F ones and he's been skiing those a bunch. He, he likes them and it. He, he's been using TTS. Hmm. I actually um, had breakfast with him this morning. Oh, really? Yeah, and he was talking about Majos. <laughs> he loves that that setup. He, uh, he, it's interesting hearing you guys. He he was he he brought up. He's like, yeah, we sold out of Majos like super fast. He's like, because me and Nate loved them, and I was like, yeah, that's fu-. it's funny because I mean that that is like part of being a salesperson too. Is I think the more passionate you are about something, it's so much easier to sell because you have a personal experience with it, you know, and. um you know, I think that can happen, you know, as you get certain equipment. It's like the very first year Tayward tier, like in 2015. I mean, we sold so many TX comps, but I think we were both skiing a stiffer boot back then. And so it was like, yeah, TX comp, TX comp. Also, it was that transition from T race and pretty much everyone had T race at that point. But I think, I think, uh, I think there's a big transition going on. And, and we've talked about this on a lot of the podcasts from, differing aspects but yeah the boot the boot and the binding combo i think people are starting to figure out like the flex of the soles really important and i don't know i think we just got to i don't know if we just got away from that for a while yeah and i i really kind of going back to that transition period and with the for me like the the free rides were a great transitionary binding into the ntn world where it gave me all the power I wanted out of an Alpine setup, mm-hmm. but and the luxury of step in and brakes, but it still gave me that soft Telemark feel. Mm-hmm. Now the fact that they didn't really upgrade that binding other than coming out with the Freedom since it came out, and it's been over a decade. I can't believe that binding still around, <laughs> and it's still around. And you know, this year with twenty two designs being delayed, we sold quite a bit of them early season because yep. people were like, I need a binding to ski on. It's it's not that it's a bad binding, like, but I'm just yeah, like I'm also surprised that it survived this long with other bindings being available that have better features in my opinion. You know, like a, a Majo or an outlaw, you can pretty much get like an updated version of what you got with a free ride absolutely know? like the outlaw is i would say better in every way other than if you prefer a softer or more forward flex point mm-hmm. or a toe or feel tiptoey feel uh that you get on the rotafella but the outlaw has more features more durable cheaper better warranty and it's easier to get parts for yeah um And Outlaw is a great binding. I just, I don't think it works for everybody. I think it works for the masses though. Absolutely. It's durable and it, it does what you want it to. Um, but with the, the NTN versus 75 millimeter, I love the argument that you can't get low. And I actually had to go back to wearing knee pads this year with the Majos and TXs because I would hit my knees on my top sheets all the time that's so funny because i literally brought this up in the podcast last week that knee pads technically 
aren't for hitting the top of the ski, but people think that's why. No, it's for shrubs and rocks. Yeah. And okay. I just want to make sure we we're on the same page. Which I but have if, never run into that problem. Okay. And and I like I got into knee pads after Sam last year blowing out up his kneecap. Oh yeah, that was weird. On that rainbow rail, and he even had knee pads on. Yeah, I don't think the rails. I don't think knee pads can save I, you in certain circumstances. Yeah, I, I I don't go in the park too much, so I'm not too worried about that. But towards okay. the end of last season and the beginning of this season. I just stopped wearing them because I know where all the rocks are at Alta. And, you know, even on a low tide season, I know don't low smoke it here, here and here and you'll be okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. Before we get too far, far gone with, that was good. That was a good mod. If I didn't know we were going to go down that path. See, you're always like, what are you going to talk about? And I'm like, we're just going to let it roll. It's plus, a, I gotta so ca- easy. plus I got to catch up with you on stuff and then I'm always impressed and I'm like, holy shit, you've got a lot of more stuff than I realized. Um, I wanted to ask you, you brought up the ski thing at the very beginning and I wanted to get into that because this has been an interesting process with you and me because I pretty much was like cutting the cores last summer. I mean, you've really stepped into a big role and I think it's been interesting. I mean, now you're, you're pretty much got a handle on it. Like you're running the show and you've taken over that but i what do you think for people that have never seen ski making what do you what do you think i guess what was the biggest surprise to you when you actually get in and you're starting to do each of the processes to make the skis uh there's two to five steps to each process (laughs) and there's probably two or three processes for each process you think about and so when you think oh there's probably seven or eight steps to a ski because you're like oh base edge core top sheet and then when you break that down it's like oh wow there's tons of steps that you just don't think about and when you dive in and i for me like it was you you didn't throw me to the wolves but you're like okay you you show up or ship out like (laughs) (laughs) you you got it you got to hit this this mark and you got to be good because we have to be good and yeah there's there's just so much that you don't think about in that ski sandwich and that there's multiple steps to prepare every layer of that ski sandwich um in the building process yeah no that's i remember thinking that too last year when i was kind of setting things up and it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot more than I, I think it, it it definitely makes you think when you look at a finished ski, like it's it it's, it kind of reminds me of you know like you talk about the, like food you eat and how dis you know the, I think a lot of people realize how disconnected they are from the food process and stuff like that. I think skiing is very similar in that sense where we've all kind of become desensitized to where our skis come from. And you're just like, yeah, I just, you know, roll down to the store and I buy the skis, but you don't really think like even in these big manufacturers, like there's still a lot of these processes going on. They might clip some things here and there, you know, like a, like a cap ski versus a sidewall ski might be a little bit different, but yeah. And 3d molds and you can automate some of these processes if you have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but like in a, a small artisanal shop, like we are here Ooh, at I like Free that. Hill Life. Artisanal. Yeah. Wow. I feel like there's like a well to drink from somewhere. Yeah. I, I like to think I <laughs> You didn't am... get that, did you? <laughs> I feel like, what are you talking about with a no, artisanal I, I well? Yeah. You get it? Anyways, keep going. Keep going. Um, but no, I like to think that I'm our, our Cicerone of, uh, what? skis. <laughs> That mimosa is getting to your brain. A Cicerone. A Cicerone is a connoisseur of beer. Um, really? Similar to a sommelier. Really? Yeah. Cicerone. Yeah, but a Cicerone. Is it Cicerone or is it Cicerone? I, I, think, I think it's just Cicerone. Um, I'm assuming this or, is Italian. I, I, you I don't, don't even know. know. I don't even know. Uh, sommelier right. for, for those who That's are more familiar. Cicerone. Yeah. All right, continue. I didn't know this. This is hilarious though. <laughs> You're a Cicerone of skis? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Where like I, you know, at at this point after now building quite a few skis and getting into the nitty gritty of how skis are made and skiing on so many skis over the years, 
uh, I really feel like, oh yeah, like you flex a ski and you can get online and look what's in it. And you're like, yep, that makes sense. Or, oh, huh. This ski like flex is really weird for what it's, what you can read online about it and what you know is in it. And you're like, oh, what did they do to get that performance out of it? Um, and so this year, like, because I kind of got into the ski building last year with you, but this year definitely gave me a new appreciation for skis of like, Oh wow. Like, you know, I, I treat skis like they're a village bicycle and it's just like, okay, that that was cool. On to the next one. Yeah. Um, and definitely this year, like looking more at skis and the time and all the effort that goes into them definitely gave me a new appreciation for what I was skiing on and definitely made me a little bit more picky of what I would ski on. Yeah, no, for sure. <clears throat> I think, uh, thank you for your kind, kind words, Cicerone. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to, that's awesome. I love that. Um, no, I, I, I think actually that is a, it, that is a good word. And I think the, the craftsmanship that goes into it, I think it does give you like a real sense of, of what, the details are and maybe the consumer sees that and i I think people that are skiing our skis because it's such low quantities like they appreciate that you know yeah and i think that's cool because it creates a relationship like i mean you're gonna have your hands on literally every single pair that goes out the door and there is blood sweat and tears in most of these yeah between legit little little nicks here and there it's like no we're just gonna wipe that right there <laughs> and then it's like it, it it is manual labor to build skis. we sterilize them before we send them out people yeah. i mean it's just, you know <laughs> there there is a final cleaning process <laughs> no that's that's cool man um yeah it's that's neat and I, I i think that means a lot to people that are getting them and and i'm that's i think you're the perfect person for the job too because i think of how many skis you have been on and and we've had this discussion i mean you can't, it's you can't make one you can't make one ski that does it all and you can't make one ski that everybody's going to like it's no. it's absolutely impossible um but i think what this this process gives us the ability to start looking at that and and what what a better person than someone who has like how what what was the final total of skis that you have 11 well no of, but of the skiable no, or, like, but you own, yeah, like, you literally yeah. own, like, what, like, 50, 60 pairs of skis? Yeah, 50, 60 pairs of skis. Yeah. I mean, that that's, that's like, I mean, you can't just be, like, you know, you're the Cicerone of, of skis, and then you have, like, uh, you know, like, uh, a six-pack of PBR, and that's <laughs> the only thing that you've ever drank, right? Like, no, yeah. one, no one's going to believe you, you know? And I think that that's important, is you got to have these experiences, different flavors, different concepts, different, um, you know, and being able to go ski places too, I think it's important too, because you, you know, you understand where, where things are coming from and why people think the way they do. Um, Oh, that, that's a touchy subject right now. Well, you mean skiing in different places? Yeah. I, I, I bought my first pass in almost a decade this, this spring. Where'd you? Oh yeah. yeah we, I bought an icon pass. Oh, interesting. I don't think that's a bad thing, though. It's it's so bad. Uh, like it's it's bad for the industry in the sense that it makes it more affordable for people out of town to come to ski resorts or you know but buy it makes vacation it, homes. But it, well, see, I think that's how it gets pegged, and I, I'll be the devil's advocate on this one because the let me hear me out on this. Like I get it because as a as a local. See th that I, I get that point you're making because it, it almost reminds me almost like a, like a locals only surf spot, you know what I'm saying? Where you're like, get off my wave, dude. <laughs> Which honestly, I've had that happen to me, like because I am the terrible surfer and I've shown up and kids have like literally tried to go over the top of me and I'm like, all right, sorry, I didn't know the rules, I didn't know where I was, whatever. I don't think it's that aggressive per se, but what I will say about Icon. Here, here's my my devil's advocate side of it is the problem is is the lift ticket is so expensive right like people can't like you said people get it so that they can have like a vacation or whatever but honestly i don't know any other way because if a lift ticket's 250 bucks to go ski someplace shout out to deer valley <laughs> i mean it, it literally is like 250 right or whatever yeah, 
I think it hit 276 this year. Right. That's crazy, right? And I love Deer Valley. It's a great place to ski. Um, but maybe yeah, go ski there, guys. I'm Deer just Valley's <laughs> the best place to ski in Utah. World class groomers. We don't know anywhere else. There's no other place. But but I'm just saying, like, I think passes may be the ex- the access point for a lot of people. I know the people you're talking about. That's not the case, and I think that that causes a lot of headaches. But Anyways, let me let me get off this subject. No, I'll, and the icon is great, and I'm going to abuse it. Where I'm gonna use I'll have, it, not abuse it. Bro. Use and abuse. Oh, okay. I'm, use I'm, it. Okay. I'm gonna burn all 28 days in Utah, and then another seven days in Bachelor next spring, and then you know I'll hopefully travel a bit to Colorado and use some days on that as well. Where Where is the most far off icon place you could go? Is it all West Coast? Uh, it's all over. Oh no, it's, it's got, all over the world now. Oh, interesting. Really, they, they have some Europe spots. God, I gotta get New caught Zealand. up on that stuff. Yeah, it's like over a hundred destinations, I think now. Well, it's, so you, uh, and and with Icon, well, okay, actually, where would you where would you like to go? Like, if you had talking about experiencing a location, where would you like to go? that you haven't experienced already. And I'm not saying like it has to be realistic, just like on your bucket list, lifelong dream. I want to go ski this place. Japan. Of oh, course. Interesting. Like Japan's number one where I need to go. And I almost went to Europe this spring. Um, but then I'm, I'm going to hood again yep. uh, to ski bum for yep. most of May. Um, but Japan is, is number one on the the list of places to go and ski out of country japan and then the alps is is number two and then number three is probably alaska and then four canada and then i really want to get down to taos uh Hmm. at least stateside for number five or yeah that's a good bucket list you haven't gone to europe yet nope sweet we got to get you over to europe that'd be that yeah, that's different. For Next sure. year, telemark only. Bring me over. I know you need. Yeah, and I think I think uh, yeah, we're gonna Tay's heading over this year again. That's a cool one for sure. I th- Europe's interesting because each each place is very unique. I mean, it's, I guess it's like the states too. I mean, that sounds silly when I say that out loud, but each each resort's kind of got its own feeling to it. You know what I mean? Um, I've never done Japan. Japan would be super cool. I kind of want to see the telemark scene there because I always see f- all these photos from these guys over there. And I'm like, it's like, I, it's, it's like the joke. It's like, it's bigger in Japan. It's like the rock band that like didn't make it in the States, but they're like huge in Japan or some yeah. stuff like that. Like it feels like telemark's huge. Like when I see all these Japanese people like telemark skiing, I'm like, Oh man, this looks like everyone's telemarking all over the place. So I guess, I guess I think powder too, like all the Niseko, Hokkaido like that 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 vibe yeah and that's that's a dream to just go eat sushi for two weeks and ski bottomless powder every day I I've decided see and and we've joked about you in the shop that you are like the snow snob (laughs) (laughs) so that's I am born and raised with from what I can tell the best snow on earth here in Salt Lake City Utah and if I'm not skiing good snow why would I want like experience i guess guess what i've 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 thought about this a lot it's actually funny we're talking about this because i've thought about this that when i see i've got the hit list when you when i'm like oh where do i go and anybody's listened to the podcast for a while it's like i'm always like i'm going to ski in alabama you know (laughs) and they're like you know what i mean there's a ski resort in alabama no there's there's one dude i found a ski resort in alabama i don't know if it's i'd do that See, that's what I'm talking about. Like, just, why wouldn't you want to go do that? Like, I want to go ski. There's one in Tennessee. We talked about this one called Gatlinburg. There's, I'm pretty sure I found one in Alabama. There's like, there's some weird shit out there, dude. Like, and okay. See, that's good. See, now I'm feeling better that you actually want to go. Cause I was like, see, like I almost got T2 beat up this year because I, I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but thank Yes. Um, but I, apparently I talked to a customer and he didn't like the way I talked about the Midwest because he thought I was coming out and I was like, nope, I'm staying here with the good snow, lower temps, or I guess higher temps. Um, 
and T2 and Miles went out to the Midwest and they had a great time and they got, they had better oh, snow it was, than we did. Oh, it was Miles that almost got beat up. No, it was T2 that almost got beat up and oh, Miles had to come over and like stop oh, the guy and be that's like, what a- this isn't the guy that you talk to. <laughs> you talk to Nate, <laughs> the snow snob. <laughs> and, and honestly, like the it's so worth it to go to that stuff. And here, and that's the thing is I might have to take you with me. So like if I, Ooh. maybe because I want to introduce you to the, uh, the layers of the travel, because it's not always if the snow's good, it's not always about the destination. It's sometimes about the journey. <laughs> yeah. That is the most disgusting thing you've ever said. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> no, but no, it's true though. And, and, uh, I think the experiences that you can get, I think, especially with the telemark stuff, because I get it. Like, it, it, like the experience of the snow is one thing. Maybe you wouldn't seek out certain experiences, but I, I do think telemark is interesting, and that's why events in these different areas are so cool for me. And I think you would dig it too, because I know you are an experiential guy, being the, the very much so the cicerone <laughs> that you are. You know, but the, the ability to go experience stuff and see it and, and, um, Midwest would be a good one. I actually would love to take you to that because I think you, you would, uh, I actually think it, you, you just need a little coaxing and, and, it, and not to look at it. They had great snow. I mean, no, they we, had better snow than we did that, when they went That's what's there. so funny, right? Like we put that blog up. I mean, they were skiing pal the whole time and the it's like, time. I know, which is super funny. There's a telemark God's looking at you being like, whatever, bro. You're just going to stay in the high pressure over here yeah. while these guys are skiing pow in the Midwest. But um, no, but I think there's all these cool places where it, it is, it's, it's experiencing the group of people. It's experiencing, you know, whatever snow happens to be there. And um, I was trying to think of another weird one that would, there's a, there's a bunch of that stuff. From what everybody said is Porky's is great, but we got to get up to Boho. Yeah, Bohemia is definitely... There's actually... Oh, man. I don't have... I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's one, there's one that's even off the radar across in Canada. Um, oh, I, I remember. There's a little festival. It's called Snowflea. And it's actually like a backcountry like kind of woods hiking area i guess hmm. I'll t- yeah but it's like across the lake in canada same kind of because because mount bohemian kind of juts the the keweenaw peninsula kind of juts up into lake superior so that's why you get that crazy lake effect and this is on the other side of that so you get kind of similar um yeah i was trying to think of any other ones um i've always wanted to go to mad river Glen. oh you'll There's like you'll a, like a mad big river. telly scene there You'll like Mad River. That's hard skiing, dude. I, I can't be on 120s. No, I was just thinking that. Like, you would literally get spanked. Because I remember going there my first time, and I think I tried to ski, like, way way too big of skis, and it's just too tight. It's too tight and too steep. And so you just, you would ha- you have, like, no time to, like, get big skis around. Well, I, I don't know. They're, someone's probably listening, and they're like, you're full of it, dude. But tighter, tighter skis, I think, are good. Actually, you know my latest on uh, that popped up this year that I did not realize is Indiana. Ooh, Indiana has skiing, and because I talked about it on one of the podcasts, there's a uh, 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 they call themselves the Pindiana Free Healers, and they have a sick logo, dude. And I, I was talking about getting it tattooed on me, of course. <laughs> I feel like I keep talking about getting stuff tattooed and I'm going to, I'm going to have like, you need a tattoo competition. uh, Like all these telemark brands or groups submit their, their tattoo idea for you. And the winner, uh, you get tattooed. That sounds terrifying. Like I could get some really messed up stuff, but, uh, well now I'm seeing like CJ from telemark Colorado is actually like he had, he tattooed a bunch of people this year. I really wanted to tattoo from him. I, I wanted free the word free on on both heels oh funny he didn't want to do it i was just couldn't link up while he was in town that's funny i left the planning up to t2 oh boy mistakes were made (laughs) uh crazy um all right to wrap up real quick you were head judge smelly knee pad yeah give me the quick lowdown on this because i don't we don't have to go too deep on it but this was how this whole 
we were supposed to be drinking mimosas and then doing the smelly knee pad. I missed it because I was sick and that sucked. And it looked awesome. I'm so pissed I missed it because it literally looked like one of the most legit in terms of um, snow conditions. Maybe not. No, it's snow conditions were awesome. Okay, like, you were just like staring at me like weird. Like I was like, did I just say something wrong, dude? <laughs> <laughs> the mimosa is hitting you. I get it. That's fine, dude. You're just like staring at me like, yeah, that was good, dude. <laughs> no, so the snow conditions, uh, pretty soft conditions all day. And then it honestly started blowing sideways as we started gathering people at the bottom of Collins to oh. head up. And then by the time we got everybody out on leathers, out on the high traverse to the hop- top of high rustler, uh, it was it was great conditions. Um, and we we had a solid crew this year. I th- just I think it was like fifteen participants, um, and then had a lot of spectators this year as well as we got to do it on high rustler, which last year, due to course uh, conditions, we had to move the venue. Um, but this year it was, it was really, it was really cool to see the guys get out there, um, and get after it. Um, we, we had some solid, uh, participation medals, uh, given out, um, (laughs) for those of you that participated, thank you for participating. Better luck next year. Um, rounding out the, the top three, we had Elliot at number three, Elliot Gore, Elliot Gore, uh, backcountry banana boy. Uh, if you want to go best name on instagram um and then number two uh as the the bridesmaid uh, (laughs) we we had uh the telly tay uh again oh yeah that wasn't he was second last year right and no the year before oh yeah last year tay uh took second to wyatt and the year (sighs) before uh was canceled because oh, all the right. resort shut down that's for right. COVID, and then the year and the year before that, uh, there's he, he an took, asterisk yeah, because two point uh, penalty. He ha- was skiing shorter skis that you gave him, I so sa- I sabotaged them. Um, t- technically, you got the championship that year, and then he had the first two years. We need to catch up on the on the plaque. Yeah, it's, we we got to update the plaque. The plaque it's not updated. So, and then yeah, and number one this year, number one was uh, Nick Hoffman. Hoff dog. Yeah. And uh Hoff dog just, you know, he had a pair of uh plastic boots break on him mid season and he Oh, was is that like, why he was skiing them so much? Yeah, the leathers? he skied on leathers thirty plus days this year because he had a pair of plastics break on him and he's like, Screw it, I'm gonna ski leathers. Beast mode. And he <laughs> he had been training real hard where Tay uh Tay was like, you know what? Leathers are the skiing's good at, towards the end of the season where normally you have a couple of weeks to prepare and build all those muscles up. But yeah, Nick Nick threw down a, a really clean line where most of us were like, is he even on leathers? Yeah, he did a legit spread eagle. Yeah, a legit a, spread eagle on high wrestler into moguls on leathers. Um, and those of you that don't know, the smelly is 200 plus centimeter skis, old school bindings, leather boots. He uh, His setup... Well, I don't know. Do you know what kind of boots he had? Low cuff leathers, no plastic reinforcement. No way. Not even kidding. Seriously? Like we were all like, what are you on? And low cuff leathers. Maybe, no. Maybe you just said that and I wasn't listening. I didn't re- really. Yeah. Whoa. That makes it even more impressive. No, it was like, wow, that was like a really clean line. Like I would have been happy if I did that on NTN gear. Cause I was going to say half dog set up when I saw it, I was like, okay, the there's a nice there's a couple little gear tricks that you can do and the binding of choice that he had was super loop rainy super loop number three third version that's a that's kind of a sneaker like it's it like that's a good binding and definitely like a good a good binding that gives you a lot of power compared to others in that lineup of era see i'm a big fan of the pitbull Oh yeah, I guess you could. I, no one's ever done that. See, that's what I have on mine. Yeah, but my, the skis that I have those mounted on aren't long enough. Yeah, I have those on. Volant I always forget. Chubs. A, I always forget. A, that's so funny. The <laughs> Volant chubs with pit bulls. Um, that's crazy that he had low cuff leathers. I'm like mind blown about that. Wow. Huh. 
doing a spread eagle and landing it yeah <laughs> with no back seat is that's legit huh but tay tay did he was he tay came in second by half a point uh with the final tally. that was it? it but that was it half point Ugh. and uh tay tay had some really nice hop turns but he didn't want to go for the air yeah so I, it was the spread eagle that got it was, him. it was the spread eagle that that won it for nick wow. um you know I, I told everybody before, I was like, I would rather see a, a crash than conservative. We're, we're here to have fun. Let's, let's, see, let's see some fun. That's solid. I love that. All right. Dude, good episode, man. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. That was good. I think the, mimo- the mimosa was a, a good addition. Maybe we'll have to make that a regular occurrence. Midday Not- mimosa. Mi- I- midday mimosa. Um Awesome. Well, congrats again on taking over the ski stuff. Looking forward to it. And we're going to be dropping uh, skis here in the next week. So stay tuned. And uh, in case you have not signed up for the mailing list, please do so. Link is in the notes to the show. And always, I would love to hear from you. You can email me at podcast at freehealthlife.com. You can shop and support us at freehealthlife.com. Pick up one of those Guru Lu teas or any of the other good stuff we got coming out this summer. And uh, thanks for listening as always. And until next week, spread telemark always.